Howdy film fans! I want to start this video with a short story. Uh, in the early mid 80s, I don't remember exactly, uh, I read an article in Rolling Stone magazine. I was a young teenager and I had just started subscribing to the magazine. Very punk, I know. Um, I lived in a small town in Maine and this was an article about Los Angeles punk gangs. So not the bands, although they figured into it heavily, and not the fans, although the gangs were made up of a certain type of fan, but these kind of street gangs, these early 80s when LA was sort of in a kind of repo man landscape, and um, disaffected youth, just like or similar to, with lots of obviously geographic, national, so on differences, th those punks from the mid to late 70s in London right? They're living in Los Angeles, you know, the mecca of paradise in America, and they see their lives going nowhere. They see, as Johnny Rotten said, no future. And this article painted a, a very sort of stark picture of these gangs as sort of violent, aggressive youths with nothing better to do but wreak havoc on society. I was an impressionable youth. I lived in central Maine, about as far away from Los Angeles as you can get in the U.S. or the, the contiguous U.S. anyway. And I'd had no exposure to punk at all except some cliches on television. They were starting to crop up by then, you know, Mohawk is weird and all this sort of stuff. So I didn't know what to think and I don't think the article was written in a sensationalist manner. By the way, if anyone knows what I'm talking about and can find this, I've searched the internet, I can't find this article, let me know in the comments because it stuck with me. I read this, I remember it was summer and I'm reading this and my, my mind was blown, but I was also, you know, it, it raised some fear in me. And I, I bring this up not to say punkers or anything to fear, but to talk about how exposure or lack of exposure can fire the imagination in ways that might not necessarily be based in reality or might be based, let's say, partially in reality or somewhat in reality. Because at this same time, in the early mid 80s, <laughs> I was heavily involved in playing Dungeons and Dragons and I was a hardcore listener of heavy metal music, early heavy metal music. Um, both of those things were subject of media scorn and media kind of overreaction. So there was this whole thing in the, in the 80s, if you don't remember, if you didn't live through it, the satanic panic and D&D and, D &D and <laughs> heavy metal were intimately wed to this satanic panic. And so that I remember, you know, some Tom Hanks TV show about this guy who plays a and d like game. Uh, becoming, you know, it was like a cult and he became obsessed and he went crazy and stuff like that. This was on TV. This was like a made for TV movie. And of course, um, Ozzy Osbourne and, and Rob Halford and Judas Priest were put on trial for their music, ostensibly having led to suicide. This was like a real kind of cultural thing. But if someone had come up to me and said, hey man, you play Dungeons and Dragons, don't you know that's gonna make you a Satan worshiper? I would have been like, dude, why don't you come play? It's fun. Let's listen to this music. Like, what are they actually talking about? It's cool. You know, they're exploring dark themes, but in a way that's really interesting. But if someone had come up to me at that time and said, man, punk's really violent and punkers are super violent and they want to destroy society, I might have been like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> because I'd had no exposure to it, except for cliches on television and this article. This would change very soon. I've mentioned in a couple of the other videos that one town over from me where I had some very good friends, very soon, right around the same time, a small but growing kind of punk epicenter for Central Maine uh, started to grow and and it became known, Orono, Maine, as like a punk town in the 80s. And I went to punk parties. I slam danced or pogoed 
uh, <laughs> and I got to know these people. And around the same time, as I've also mentioned, my mom remarried and my stepbrother moved in. He was my age and he was a punker. He had a shaved head and a mohawk. And he listened to, you know, the Sex Pistols, as I've said, but he also listened to like uh, Social Distortion. And he listened to, he loved uh, the Butthole Surfers and Suicidal Tendencies and all kinds of stuff. Suicidal tendencies were an important part of this article, if I recall. Um, so by sort of 87, 88, if someone had come up to me and said, oh, punk's violent and punk rockers want to destroy society, I would have been like, dude, let's talk about what they mean when they say destroy society. You know? and, and because I'd had the exposure to it. And, you know, whatever, whenever there's some sort of moral panic, which society loves because it keeps us going like this instead of going like this. <laughs> um, it's always a good idea to sort of step back and say like, what's actually being talked about here? Um, this is a long way to introduce today's film, which is a documentary from the early 80s about Southern California punk scene, Los Angeles in particular. And one of the things I think that this film tries to do, and we'll talk about how well it does so, is to walk a thin line between punk can be violent. Punk, you know, this is an anti-establishment. It is the music of disaffected youth, and we've talked about that in all the videos so far. But also, it's very creative, and it gives voice to that disaffection. And what happens when you give voice to the disaffected? What happens when they're allowed to believe there's a future, even if it's slim? What happens when they are allowed to come together with like-minded people and create change, even if it's only change in their own life? And even if that change is sometimes adjacent to or even grounded in violent behavior? So the film tries to walk this line in a way that I think makes it, in terms of this series, the most kind of elucidating. It sheds the most light for me so far on what punk was, what punk was trying to do, what punk couldn't quite do, and what the dangers of punk were, all in one film. And that film is 1981's documentary, The Decline of Western Civilization, which we're going to talk about in this episode of What Makes This Film Great. <laughs> the Decline of Western Civilization is directed by Penelope Spheris, one of the great unsung documentarians and filmmakers of the last 50 years in America, written by Penelope Spheris as well, although as a documentary that tends to mean the narrative is crafted in the editing and so on by Spheris. Um, it's got cinematography by Steve Conant and it's edited by Charlie Mullen among others. And it is a documentary, as it says in the opening title card, filmed from December 1979 through May of 1980 in Los Angeles about the Los Angeles punk scene, hardcore punk scene. And so it's, it, it was filmed just as the Sex Pistols are kind of shining bright across America and imploding. Um, and around the time leading up to and around Sid Vicious's death. So it's very contemporary to that. Sometimes I think when I talk to people about punk, there's this sense that hardcore happened like after the fact, but this is happening at the same time. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's a very simple documentary. It features talking head interviews with band members, with punk fans, with some club owners, and with the writers and editors of, of Slash Magazine, which would later become Slash Records as well, or was in the process of becoming Slash Records. And then it features a lot of live performances, and the live performances are fantastically filmed, in part because while we get a lot of scenes of these bands playing on stage, we get a lot of scenes of the audience. Sometimes long stretches just of the audience 
with no band just playing in the background so we get to see how this music is affecting the fans. I think that's a very valuable part of this documentary. And that's it. So how can it do all the things that I implied it was trying to do in the top? Well, by letting these people and this music speak for themselves. After a brief introductory interview with a, a kid named Eugene, and I'll come back to him in a few minutes, it establishes a, a pattern that it doesn't stick with completely, but sort of sets the, the framework for the film, which is to show one of the bands live and then cut to interviews with some band members and then kind of cut back and forth between that band and their live performances and interviews performance, interviews, performance, and the interviews and the performance often comment on each other, sometimes directly. We'll have a band member talking about this song, how they wrote it, where it came from, and then we'll see them playing that song. Sometimes a little less directly, where we'll have a band member talking about, you know, society or what it's like to be poor or whatever it might be, and then we'll have a song that's not, you know, named by them, but that relates to what they're talking about. The bands that are featured are Black Flag, the Germs, X, Catholic Discipline, The Circle Jerks, The Alice Bag Band, and Fear. And in the first half, we get these really extensive interviews with the members of Black Flag, The Germs, and X. Then we don't get so many interviews or any interviews really with The, the Circle Jerks or Alice Bag or Fear. Which, for me, <laughs> mostly because I love the Circle Jerks, I would have loved to seen what they had to say. And by the way, if you take anything away from watching this movie or watching this video, get yourself a copy of the Circle Jerks group sex, because that, to me, is like, I mean, the germs, awesome, you know, uh, Black Flag's got a ton of stuff to listen to, but group sex, to me, is like ground zero of early 80s L.A. punk. At one point in the film, we return to Eugene along with a bunch of other punk fans. They call these the light bulb kids or the light bulb interviews because the way they're framed and shot is different from the rest of the film. And there's this low and sort of bare light bulb hanging in the, in the frame. And they talk a lot about uh, what it means to be a punk or why they're into punk. And <laughs> this is where a lot of the sort of violence in the film or discussions of violence come in because these people are inclined to or at least talk about being inclined to violence. I put a guy in the hospital here a little while back. What happened? Uh, broke his nose and his jaw, cut up his face. They said I hit him with a chain. I guess I did. I was a little bit drunk. I didn't remember. What's the pent-up aggression? Where does that come from? Well, with me, it just comes from like living in this city and just seeing everything seeing all the ugly old people and just the fucking the buses and the just the dirt that you know just not what's that's what i see all the time so it's just all the time I'm just fucking bummed and just thinking about that so when i go there i just sometimes i can get out some aggression maybe by beating up some asshole you know then we get quite a few interviews with club owners, bouncers, and so on, also often talking about the violence, whether they'll let the punk bands play in their clubs or not, and if not, why not? Um, we get one uh, bouncer talking about how some fans jumped on, on stage during a performance of X and tried to rip Xine Cervenka's clothes off and how he had to kick their ass pretty drastically. People talk about ending up in the hospital, people talk about being bloody, people talk about hurting themselves, people talk about getting so wasted that they don't feel it when they hurt themselves. And this can all be quite harrowing, I think. And in some ways, it's a lot more sort of in your face than what we get from something like Jubilee, which is obviously fictionalized, or even the Sex Pistols movies where we do get some spitting and we do get Sid Vicious cutting himself, but 
a lot of the the sort of interactions between the band and the audience tend to be separated. There is one moment when when Sid hits an audience member with his guitar, and then we get an interview with that guy later. Um, whereas here in these interviews, it's not just the the violence between the, the the kids and the band, but between the kids and each other, which sort of feeds into the article I talked about at the top, where these kind of gangs apparently grew up around different areas in Los Angeles, most specifically in the Valley and Hollywood, dedicated to certain bands and that they, they would show up and, and fight each other. And you get reactions to this in punk eventually where punk singers start talking about like, hey man, <laughs> we're here together. We're not like slam dance, you know, get your aggression out, but we're not fighting each other. I I think I understand what Pogo is. I put on a couple of shows up here, and uh, they've come off with no real problems. Yeah. The last show yeah. I was at here, you you had a cat that had a long blonde hair, and sure. as soon well, as uh, he didn't understand, as you're yeah. pointing out, he did not understand the difference between pogoing and real violence. There is no actual difference. Violence is violence, but I mean, if they're bashing each other and enjoying it, well, that's. A Others, on the other hand, and I'll come back to this, liked to provoke that and felt like that's what made it punk, pushing the people to violence. So watching them talk about this and then seeing the footage of it, we do see fights. We do see quite intense slam dancing. We do see people jump up on stage. We do see singers and audience members fight with each other. This, this is all present here amidst the talk about and the songs about being left behind, being forgotten, being ostracized, being outcast, being kicked in the face, all of these sorts of things that these punkers are singing about. And so it gets difficult, I think, I would argue, to just like point a finger at these kids because, well, first of all, they don't care. And second of all, like if you've got some kind of empathy, if you have an empathy muscle, <laughs> The film starts to work that muscle and you don't walk away from it going, yeah, man, I want to go to a punk show and beat the shit out of everybody there too. But you start to maybe think about, and this is what I argue the film's trying to get us to do, think about the conditions, the material conditions that lead these kids to this kind of expression. And that is where I think a lot of punk's power in the end comes from or can come from is that we shouldn't look at that we shouldn't look at them we shouldn't take part in it and be like you know screw them they deserve what they get we should look at it and say why is it like that the film sets this up early there's an interview in the hollywood hills with a guy named brendan mullen who was the owner of a club at the time and he's talking about what they're still calling throughout this film pogo dancing, which supposedly Sid Vicious invented, or at least took credit for inventing. And that's the dancing, jumps, just jumping up and down, straight up and down. If you're not familiar with this term, these days it tends to be called slam dancing or more often even moshing. But it all kind of extends from that. And Mullen's talking about how the music's so fast that that's the only way you can really dance to it. Um, he says 300 beats per minute, which I think is an exaggeration, but yeah. But then he says something interesting about why this music, why the speed of the music, and why this style of dancing is necessary. Some of the better of the, the punk bands have developed into sort of like folk music. I don't mean folk music as a traditional folk music, but the allegory can be, allegory can be drawn in the 60s when protesters used acoustic guitars. Now, instead of acoustic guitars, you know, they have high speed, 300 beats a minute, speed rock, and uh, yelling about the same things, about how that air is poisoned out there. You know, the, the air in Utopia is poisoned. You know, the final joke. The air in Utopia is poisoned. I love this line. I love this line because it, it creates a metaphor that goes into, you know, it sets up this working of the empathy muscle that I was talking about. Because 
if you're in Utopia, Los Angeles, oh, the, the Dream Factory. Um, and by the way, I've talked a lot about how the Dream Factory of Los Angeles isn't in, in videos like uh, Sunset Boulevard and Day of the Locust and The Player. You can go check those out. Um, but if you're there in Utopia and the air is poisoned, you know, that is not your fault. And what you do to try to thrive in that situation or just survive in that situation, you know, we have to kind of try to understand it. And I think putting this interview with Mullen this early in the film is an attempt to frame it in that way. The first band we spend extensive time with is Black Flag, and this is an iteration of Black Flag. There's Greg Jinn, of course, who's the guitar player and founder and sort of the, the, the permanent member of Black Flag. But the singer is Ron Reyes, who is the second singer, very short-lived singer. Most people know Black Flag as Henry Rollins' band, but they actually had three singers at least before Rollins joined and became their sort of longest term and kind of most famous singer. And, and Reyes is an interesting figure, I think, in this film because he's originally from Puerto Rico. He talks about this. He makes a little joke about it. Where are you from? Well, I'm, I'm Puerto Rico. Yeah. But I like to live in America. <laughs> And he's, he's living in a squat flat or a, some sort of crash pad. He says he pays like $16 a month for rent, which is all he can afford. Um, and he's a very likable guy in the interview, as are a lot of these punkers. And then he gets up on stage and he sings really disaffected songs. And he has talked about this disaffection, and it, it's sad for like an older teen or, or a young adult. Um, and you feel it, he's a nice guy, but there's some sadness there. And then he gets up and sings these songs. And one of the songs we see them sing is called Depression. And I hadn't seen this film for a long time before I watched it again for this series. And this song really struck me, and I think it affected the way I responded to the film this time because. I think if you listened to Depression today, and this was a new song, this song sounds like an incel manifesto. That's probably going to piss off some of the old school punkers out there. But he's basically talking about how I have no friends, I have no support, no girls love me, I have nothing, nobody understands me, I'm all alone. <laughs> I mean, this, these are the sentiments that percolate throughout kind of you know, men's rights, incel, some shooter manifestos, you know, the, the online culture of these people. And I'm watching it and I was thinking, seriously, like, what is the difference? And look, like I've said, I'm not a sociologist. I make no sort of claims to understand all this, but I think the difference is the community of punk and the way that punk gives Reyes and other people this voice because throughout the film, the bands and the fans and even the club owners talk about how this expression of not just the angst of the lyrics, not just the speed of the music, but this expression, this like bodily expression of frustrated energy is necessary, as Mullen says, it's necessary. As such, it allows them a, a place to express these feelings with other people. And I do think there's a difference. I don't want to be like old man yells at clouds and be, you know, like the internet is, because the internet brings a lot of people together. The internet has saved people, you know? The internet has helped people who feel alone find like-minded people. I'm not saying 
you know, the internet is bad. The, the internet, like everything, has its bad sides and it has its good sides. But I think when there is this loneliness and this sense of rejection, this sense of anger, feeling outcast, that coming together, even if you look around this room and feel like, I don't know, one of these mofos and nothing they can do can help me, just being in the room with them and being free. I mean, this is like a safe space in a really like meaningful use of that term. Being free to bang up against each other, being free to yell, being free to spit like that. Like people look at the Sex Pistols and they spit throughout this film as well. The, the audience, the, the bands. Being free to do that is like opening a valve and letting out the steam. And you know, when I would have watched this film in my younger days, it would have been like at arm's distance being like, wow, man, those guys are crazy. Not like I was when I read the article at 14 or 15 or whatever it was, but still in a kind of, I don't know if I could have survived that scene. You know, when I was talking to Tempus in the interview, um, I asked her what punk scene would you want to visit? And she was like the, the riot girls or, or maybe the queer punk scenes in Canada. And I was thinking, what, what she, she asks me, what am I going to say? And I was like, oh yeah, Southern California hardcore. And I look at this and maybe not because I love the music, but boom. But now when I'm watching this again, I feel like, like a deep sort of desire to like hug these guys. It's probably cheesy old man talk. Um, because that kind of loneliness and that kind of, you know, feeling of being ostracized is hard. And young people feel it no matter what their situation because all this stuff's going on. But feeling it when you're, as some of these kids are orphans, they talk about not knowing their parents, they talk about not knowing where they come from. Some of them have had like harrowing experiences with drugs, with crime, uh, being victims themselves of brutality, whether it's like racist violence or police brutality. You know, they are removed from, in many ways, the... <sighs> the cultural conditions that allowed someone like me, and my life was not roses, but someone like me to negotiate those feelings of loneliness and those feelings that nobody understands in a way that was <laughs> mostly, mostly healthy. And this scene is, is allowing them to do this. And I think this film does do a great job mostly of depicting what they're doing, why they're doing it, and why it's okay. The film also addresses punk attitudes more indirectly. Like there's a famous scene from the film when they're interviewing Darby Crash, the singer of The Germs, and his girlfriend Michelle. And Michelle tells this story about this house painter who, um, you know, the, her parents were out of town in China and these people were contracted to fix up the house. And one night she goes outside and there's a body, it's dark, and she steps over the body of this person lying on the ground and it's one of the house painters. And as she says, I went over and looked at him and I was just joking. I went, this guy's dead. And I gave him a kick in the stomach, you know, and he was dead. Uh, he was dead. The brother thought we killed him. He goes, what should we do? Like, should we hide the body or something? So anyways, um, we went and Donnie had a camera. And we went and we lied down. I lied down next to him. We all got around and we took a bunch of pictures, like family pictures. And we're all going, hi, you know, and taking pictures and stuff. Didn't you feel bad that the guy was dead? No, not at all. Because I hate painters. And that line, I think <laughs> the film at, a time, at the time got a lot of criticism for its kind of nihilism. And Penelope Spheris has said that was really a joke and the story was longer and it was a big wind up. But that line kind of sticks out when, when she's asked, how did you feel? Did you care that you found this dead guy? And she's like, no, I don't like painters. And this is a sort of, I don't know if it's sensationalizing punk, 
or if it's part of the sort of sardonic nature of punkers who are willing to say anything to to get a rise uh, but you know this is one of the ways that the film expresses these attitudes beyond just like punk is this and punk means this to me and and what was me my life is poor and i I've, I've been shat upon so now i have to take it out through my music you also get this moments like this which like if you unpack it her parents are in china and they've hired people to come fix up her house like how how far down in the gutter does she actually live not everyone in the punk scene was from that kind of background um another example that i find really interesting is during the interviews with x and the interviews with x are fantastic for so many different reasons including these little tiffs that xine and john doe have but there's a scene there's a moment when xine is talking about this song that the band plays we're desperate which is about like being poor and having no money and having nowhere to go and all this sort of stuff. And Exene talks about how when they wrote that song, they knew that if they were ever successful one day, they'd have a hard time singing that because their very success might make the song hypocritical. And it's really weird because at one point I started thinking, there's gonna come a point when we're gonna keep performing this song, people are gonna go, sure, they're desperate. I just paid six dollars to see this band, you know, they're not desperate. They're There's not worse money. ways of being desperate than being poor. But you don't have money right now. And so yeah. Well, we're not rich. We got, we got enough money to pay our rent and you know, we bought the ink and the pens. <laughs> it's almost a little throwaway that's used to set up their performance of the song. Um, but she's talking here about selling out. And I think it's very interesting that when we talk about like the 90s discussions I've alluded to before about who did Green Day sell out, did Rancid sell out, did Bad Religion sell out, all that sort of stuff. Here, Exene's worried about the fact that <laughs> they can pay their rent, they can afford ink and needles for these homemade sort of jailhouse style tattoos that they're administering. John Doe's giving people tattoos throughout the uh, this whole interview sequence. and. You know, they can afford tattoo ink, they can afford rent, and they can afford beer. <sighs> Maybe they've sold out. Maybe they're not desperate anymore. This is such a different conception of financial success than whatever Green Day achieved, you know, and it reframes this discussion of selling out in a way that I find really kind of endearing and also kind of naive and also kind of real. All at the same time. One of the really important, I think, intriguing parts of the film that gets talked about a little bit less is a middle segment when they spend time at the offices of Slash Magazine or Slash Fanzine or Slash Zine. Slash was a magazine that ran from 1977 to 1980, so soon after this film came out, and it was a monthly punk magazine and the 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 film spends about 12 or 15 minutes talking to the editors the writers the layout editor the copy editor at slash reading letters to the editor talking about some of the articles and so on um, and two of the people featured here i think are really interesting one is bob biggs robert biggs and biggs was married to spheris at the time and Biggs was in the process while this film was being made of spinning off Slash Records. And Slash Records came about because the Germs needed to put out their music and nobody was gonna sign them. They weren't gonna get an EMI deal or a Virgin Records deal. So Slash Records came about and Slash is one of the most kind of important, especially in those early 80s days, independent labels in American music history and Biggs would become the founder of it and, and run it for, for many years. Uh, he shows up a little bit, but what's really interesting is the, the head editor of the magazine, Claude Bessie, a Frenchman known as Kickboy Face, shows up. He's also the lead singer of Catholic Discipline. We see some of their appearances in the, in the film. And, and Kickboy is fascinating in this. He reads a lot of letters to the editor. Some of them are quite dark. Dissolve and die. Lie through your teeth. Accepting the fact that these masses, these perpetual bourgeois, never leave their happy homes in the suburbs and refuse to learn new ideas, they still disgust me. Do I belong? 
You see them laugh. They laugh at themselves and call it comedy. They laugh at each other and call it satire. They laugh at cripples and call it cruelty. Mass middle class laughter permeating every conversation. They keep themselves in stitches and think they're happy. Again, that, that feels to me very modern in its disaffection and maybe that just speaks to the way young people, young people on the edge have been feeling maybe forever. But what I love is Bessie's reaction like, hey, this is what we're dealing with, you know? And he is sort of punk through and through and I think he's an unsung figure in the early days of punk in America, especially West Coast punk, because he really kind of proselytized for punk in his writing, in his music, and just kind of in his attitude, maybe because he was a little bit older than a lot of the punkers, maybe because he was French, I don't know. He was very articulate in his expression of why punk was necessary. And one of the interesting parts in the film is when he talks about kind of the death of the hippie dream. I mean, there's no, there's, you know, there's no more brotherhood shit, you know. <laughs> why not? It's not like, uh, you know, we're not all grooving on the same vibes anymore. Everybody's grooving on different vibes. Ugly vibes. Throughout the film, there are a few references to hippies, and it's always sort of dripping with scorn. And what I love about Kick Boy's conversation here, or his kind of mini rant, is that he doesn't come right out and say it, but in the subtext of what he's saying, I think it, there's a lot of sort of resentment that the hippie dream died. And it's very similar, although different, to the air of utopia is poisoned you know this is not the la of you know quentin tarantino this is not the late 60s early 70s la this is not sort of free love and weed and lsd that's gone and it didn't work and it failed and what we have left is economic depression we have reagan on the horizon we have a sense of failure in the wake of vietnam we have skyrocketing sort of divorce rates we have you know so-called broken families and this is the reality and and kickboy puts that in these really stark terms that again much like the mullen piece at the beginning contextualizes a lot of what we're seeing like what do you expect another great thing about the film again somewhat subtle no one comes right out and says it is the at least somewhat you know, level or layer of inclusivity in the scene so we get people like pat smear who a lot of you might know as the guitar player for the foo fighters was briefly in nirvana but he's a founding member of the germs and pat smear is half African-American. We get Ray, as I mentioned, from Puerto Rico. We get Alice Bagg singing and Exine Cervinka singing. So female lead singers, there's female bassists, guitarists, and so on. So the punk scene, although there is a lot of white boy energy going on for sure, and there is a lot of kind of flagrant use of non-PC language. This is 1980, 79, 80, before the rise of PC, which was just over the horizon, in a way, in reaction to different strains of the 80s. But it's also part of that provocative nature of punk. There are some swastikas. There's a really kind of sad and funny uh, moment when an Asian American punk fan who's wearing a swastika is asked about it and he says like, I don't want to kill Jews. It's just like, <laughs> does not compute. I would say it was a poor choice and eventually punk is going to decide like we don't want the Nazi punks and, and Jello Biafra is going to be right there singing his famous song. But there is a lot of sort of provocative language and there is like if you're if you're not prepared for some nasty racial epithets, some very strong homophobic diatribes and some sexist language, just be forewarned that this film has those things. But the actual living and breathing punk scene that we see, while mostly white, is inclusive of what I think Southern California looked like, what Southern California looks like. And there's a sense that punk's outward face 
is provocative and will use language meant to offend. But when we get where we want to be, all that matters is that you're punk too. You're my kind of punk because there is that sort of geek keeping and fighting that I've talked about in other videos as well. But there's one example of this that I have a hard time with. The film ends with a long live segment of the band Fear. And Fear has weaved in and out of my life for a long time. This is a band that's, that's like a kind of fundamental cornerstone of SoCal punk. And the singer leaving is kind of a fundamental, seminal figure of Los Angeles punk. And they were basically, or so the story goes, discovered by Spheris as she was preparing to make the film. She met Ving and other members of the band who were, they were hanging up sort of flyers for a gig and she talked to them, you're in a punk band, yeah, do you want to be in my film? And they were in the film, they are in the film, and that led them to putting out their first record, The Record, on Slash. Um, and that record is in a lot of ways incredible. Like, Fear is a really good band. They rock hard, they rock fast, it's nasty, but it's also, in here I'm talking about the music, very smart. Ving was like Kick Boy, an older member of this kind of subculture. He was around 30 by this point, and he had played in folk bands, rock bands, metal bands. He had a vast kind of musical vocabulary. And you hear that in Fear. I mean, Fear the Record is a punk record, but you hear the influence of blues. You hear in a song like Camarillo, what I think is a pretty clear source for thrash metal that's coming down the pike. I mean, that song is like, metal and hard and it uses different time signature and it's just so like, so ferocious and they're really really good but i don't like this band very much ving is in the sort of grand tradition of punk a provocateur and he says whatever he thinks needs to be said to cause a ruckus and this is nowhere more true than in the decline of western civilization so the film ends with them it gives them this sort of pride of place of closing out the film and the opening of their performance is a sort of two or three minute tirade where Ving and other members of the band basically just hurl homophobic epithets at the audience. And this would have been uncomfortable for me at the time. It's definitely uncomfortable for me today. And I just wanted to say a few words about it because Fear is incredibly influential. I mean, like I said, they were influential on metal. Kurt Cobain called this one of the most important albums in his life. You know, they are really good. I Don't Care About You is just like pure, awesome rage, anger and rage, and it's so good. Um, let's start a war. There's too many of us. There's too many of us. There's too many of us. And then boom, the way it kicks in, it's, it's really good. But for me, and I've had this discussion many times, I lived with a guy who loved fear. And we used to just go round and round about this. And it really, like how you're gonna take them comes down to how much you accept that Ving is singing and performing and talking through layers of ironic distance and then how much you accept that as okay. How much does that excuse what it is he's saying? And for me, I mean, sometimes he's funny. When they were on their famous Saturday Night Live performance where all the punkers showed up and got into a fight, which go check it out, it's on YouTube. And he says, we're gonna sing a song now. Here he is, he's from Philadelphia originally, they're from Los Angeles, and he's here in New York, and he's like, we're gonna do a song now called New York's All Right If You're Into Saxophones. Genius. Awesome. <laughs> I, I 
begrudgingly sort of love that. But his whole idea that punk thrives on violent energy and that it's his job not to express himself, not to you know give voice to this, but to provoke that violent aggression. And I'm not just reading into this. He says at the beginning of their appearance in Decline, you know, uh, we haven't been allowed to play here before because they think we're going to riot. So let's show them. Let's do it. You know, so he's pushing for this. And I don't love it. I get why people do. Um, but I find it... To me, Ving comes across a lot more like a Malcolm McLaren type than he does like a Darby Crash or a Reyes or a Jello Biafra type who are trying to actually deconstruct the societal situation that has led to the rise of punk. I mean, he does that a little bit. There are some lines in Let's Start a War where he's talking about, you know, he's got this very kind of ironic voice where he's talking about you know, it, it's very much like a punk war pigs and, you know, who's going to benefit from the war. And he's singing as one of these people who's going to benefit from the war. And it's a clever song, no doubt. But he always takes it the next level and goes into insulting. You know, he punches down. And for me, the best punk punches up. And so he tries at the end, he does this thing where as the band is finishing up their set, they do a little bit of the American National Anthem and he ends it like this. For the land of the free. And it seems to be saying, after all of his like, really intense um, homophobic diatribes, to be saying, this is the land of the free and also gay people too, where he, he turns everything he said on its head and, and forms this more kind of begrudging inclusivity. But I find it's like sort of too little too late or, or fake or phony. So I'm glad that fear is in there and I'm glad that we see this face of that scene because it's an important face and it's an important part of what was going on in punk and what continues to go on in punk. But I also, you know, it, it, it's part of the, the problematics of the film. And for me, Fear and Ving and what they're giving expression to and how they're giving expression to it is a lot more troublesome than the lost kids who are trying to figure their shit out and sometimes as they're on that journey end up resorting to some violence that gets them and other people into trouble. Because Ving, for all his bravado and for all the band's like real pure talent, remains above it and, and removed from it. And I think there's something in there to analyze that probably some people have that I don't have time to get into here. But I think it's a very interesting and provocative choice on the part of Spheres, who apparently loved Fear, to end the film with them. Because they're a different kind of band, Ving is a different kind of person, a different kind of performer than all the stuff that we've seen before. And I don't know if she does this intentionally to say, yeah, let's have this pity party for these poor kids, but also there's this, or if she just, really loved them at the time. Spheres calls herself a punker. She says she's a punker at heart. She made this film, I think, without a lot of irony when we compare it to her follow-up, uh, Decline of Western Civ Part 2, which is all about heavy metal, and she's clearly looking at Kiss in these bands with sort of her tongue firmly in cheek. I don't think she's doing that here. So the decision to end with Fear, I find confusing, I guess. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. How, how, how do you take fear, especially those of you who are sort of old school punkers, what's your take on fear? 
Thanks for watching everybody. I highly recommend this film. It's a fascinating time capsule. It's a really great example of what you can do in a documentary when you let your subjects speak for themselves. And everybody knows that they're on film. In fact, there's a very funny sequence that opens the film where we see the singers from each of the bands reading to the audience to let them know you're going to be in a punk film um, and then making fun of it. <laughs> so, you know, it's done fully with the participation of everyone involved and they're allowed to tell their stories. And it's a, it's a great example of how that can work in documentary. And the story that it tells is riveting, the music amazing, and it really like will teach you a lot about, and a lot of it's contradictory, but it will teach you a lot about what American punk was, what it wanted to be, and maybe it will hint at some of the failures and some of the later successes that were very different from what these early bands intended. That's all for now, everybody. If you've made it this far, as usual, please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. Share this video with your friends. Share it with any punkers you know. What do you think of the decline of Western civilization? Is it as good or does it do as well what I've said it does? Let me know in the comments. Also, you'll find down there the link to my Patreon page if you want to help me out a little more. I'll be back soon with more videos about punk cinema. Until then, keep watching movies.